So next we're going to move on um, to our case study section. So sort of three practical projects. So first up, we have got um, Barney Tremaine. He was going to speak to us on groundswell and the sort of the no-till and weed dynamics and implications of IPM that they do with the groundswell project. So Barney recently joined Western Park Farms as a farm manager, and he's also the technical manager for groundswell. He's really interested in regenerative agriculture and no-till and trying to push the boundaries of modern, modern farming. I'd like to say a special thank you to, to Barney as uh, the previous farm manager was originally going to, to do this talk. Um, and when Barney's taken over the post, he um, stepped in to talk to us today. Okay, so thank you. Over to you, Barney. Right, hopefully everyone can see and hear me okay. Um, yeah, you're good, thank you. Good. Uh, everyone have to bear with me a little bit. Um, morning everyone. I, uh, this is the first Zoom presentation I've done like this, so uh, hopefully it will go right without any hitches. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, as I said, farm manager at Western Park Farms uh, and the technical manager for Groundswell. Uh, I started that in July, so uh, pretty recent really, straight into harvest. So. Again, um, you'll have to take some of this um, slightly subjective with that. So, um, Western Park Farms, uh, we're based just north of Stevenage. Um, we are 1,000 hectares, of which probably 800 hectares is arable, uh, 200 hectares is permanent pasture, and we're running sort of 140 beef short on sucker cows. Um, and followers. So at any one time, there's sort of 350 to 400 head of cattle on the farm. Uh, and we're the host for the Groundswell show. Um, so just a bit more about Groundswell and how that came about uh, for those that don't know. Um, John and Paul Cherry are the owners here and have farmed here for 30 years. Um, they, in the last 15 years, had a big sort of concern over their soil, soil health, and how the farm was going. Um, you know, they'd gone from a plough system to a sort of min till system on a heavy um, boulder clay over chalk predominantly. And, you know, they're like beating it around a lot, using a lot of diesel machinery, losing a lot of time. You know, there wasn't many windows to plant crops and having a massive burden of black grass over that time. Um, so 10 years ago, in 2010, they went full no-till uh, and uh, to try and, you know, conserve that soil and uh, make some improvements. Um, Groundswell then came about in 2015 and the first show was in 2016, where they felt there wasn't really any sort of uh, farmer-led knowledge exchange or real show uh, for no-till and regenerative agriculture in the UK. So they really wanted to access um, worldwide information and uh, try and get some more information out to other farmers who might be interested uh, and also learn from other farmers. So as I said, you know, we've got international speakers and attendees. There's 3,000 plus visitors over two days um, on the farm here. And we do practical demonstration seminars and it's a good social, uh, some good food. So why regenerative agriculture? I guess really important bit here, and you know, take a bit out of the dictionary, but basically they wanted to make their farm better and improve the condition, sort of the regenerative. And there's a lot of different people view regenerative agriculture in different ways, but um, I'll go through a few ways in which we, or the farm here has sort of taken that process and moved with it. So the current view is, you know, everything runs through soil and the current system's broken. Um, soil degradation, you know, you've got mass erosion and from here you could see that on certain fields where, you know, soil had moved to the bottom where they've been knocking it around previously uh, and neighbours, you can still see it over the hedge. Um, you know, losing a lot of carbon out of the soil, there's a massive over reliance on artificial wen uh, and other inputs and it, it, and certainly John and Paul felt that, it, you know, it sort of, the whole thing was dysfunctional really in terms of working with where they've been here over time, um, looking at reduction in other parts of the ecosystem, uh, you know, pollinators and birds and things. They're also concerned about sort of the poor nutritional values of some of the crops and nutrient density and felt that some of them, you know, should be better than where they are. Uh, and it's sort of early days for that. But they're the sort of main reasons um, they felt that what we had to do was to change really. 
So the sort of solutions really all center around carbon in the fact that, you know, soil carbon, um, there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere as everyone's aware, and it's, you know, it's a big topic nowadays. And, and carbon sort of really drives everything. Um, plants rely on it, then there's um, through photosynthesis, and it, you know, getting that into the soil, you can sequester it, hold it there, and, and utilize that for the biology. Um, so really stimulate and facilitate the soil's biology um, is key in the fact that, you know, you've got this process that could work naturally. And you, if you look at it, you know, under a hedge or in other areas that aren't disturbed and not an arable field, um, something's always growing there. And it always, you know, the soil, if you dig it up, is sort of what you see at the bottom there. You know, it's this sort of aggregated, usually quite dry um, soil that, you know, just crumbles and is lovely. And you look at sort of our arable ground, which is a lot stiffer um, and it's sort of chalk and cheese really and it sounds a bit cheesy but they really wanted to get back to harnessing sort of the power of nature so to speak and it can be a sort of bit very fairy but really you know look at it there is a sort of a natural interlinks and everything you know works in a sort of a, a system uh, and it's more trying to get the farm back to working somewhere within that so just really using um, soil organic matter is sort of an indication really of, of soil health and uh, the sort of carbon element within that. Um, you can see here, this, this is some um, organic matter tests that were done um, last year, uh, August I think it was, and taken off a variety of different um, arable farm fields. So none of this is permanent grass, this is all arable ground. Uh, and that's sort of from last year, that's that's where we were really as, as an average for um, soil organic matter. And why is that important? So we did a, a carbon audit also in March this year, um, where you can see there the headline figure, there's roughly, we're on average doing, if you put it all through the calculator, roughly speaking, we're doing 10 tonnes a hectare a year of um, sequestered carbon, which is really good. I draw your attention to the right hand side there, but baseline organic matter tests they did back in 2010, the farm was about 3%. So we've managed a 3% rise in the last 10 years of organic matter, which in theory should um, speed up as time goes on. But um, that's quite impressive, I think, in terms of from where they were to where they are uh, on this soil type. And uh, it's really starting to show. The organic matter is what is sequestering all of that carbon. You can see here that, you know, livestock and inputs and that are all emitting carbon. Some, you know, livestock can be argued is quite high, but soil health and that carbon element is um, what really, really um, driving this and the whole thing. So one of the other things you do, real good indication, earthworms for soil structure, health um, and for 10 years, this was taken last year, one, you know, everywhere you go now, there is earthworms where you dig up, you know, there's 30 plus most of the time, sometimes depending on the time of year um, and what you're digging up, but um, really good indicator. So in terms of how we sort of went about that, looking at sort of the whole system really was trying to reduce uh, the artificial inputs as much as possible. You know, there's plenty of then, uh, both in the soil and also in the atmosphere that's sort of free and we're paying to put it on, how do we access it? And so you managed to reduce the um, artificial bag N by 35% at the moment from your sort of conventional levels for wheat. Um, we've also not applied any P and K for the 10 years. As I said, you take soil samples, there's plenty there and you should be able to, a lot of it's just unavailable, um, just trying to really bring that back into the system through biology. And just general pesticide usage is reduced and trying to, you know, not put as much herbicide on and others because they all have a uh, sort of degrading factor to the soil and the environment. So it's all zero till using a dish drill, started with a 750A now with this weaving. Uh, the idea being that we want to disturb as little of that soil surface as possible. Um, you know, always keeping an armour, whether it's chopped straw or some of the mulch and keeping living roots um, growing as much as possible to keep that biology alive. Really key to have as diverse a sort of farm and environment as possible. So we're trying to keep uh, diverse crops uh, and a rotation. Uh, currently the rotation's got, you know, 
is quite flexible because flexibility is quite key to this uh, because you've got to react to conditions. So, you know, we've got rape, beans, um, temporary lays, and we also grow in wheat, barley, cereals, um, heritage, grains, spelt, linseed, you know, there's a lot. <laughs> Where do you stop? We're also really key to this is cover crops, which anyone knows or looked at no-till. Um, cover crops over winter and catch crops between harvesting and planting autumn crops is really key. We want to keep those living roots for the biology because as soon as you take it out, it doesn't take long for the bi biology to drop back and you then start burning carbon uh, rather than introducing more. We're also trying to companion crop. So we still grow rape on the farm. Uh, and over the last few years, you know, you know, don't really have an issue with flea beetle. Some of the others, some of that would be, you know, might be other reasons with predatory insects, but some of it is also, we've put companion crops. So we've buckwheat, uh, bursting clover and vetch was the main ones we started with. And this year we've uh, included mustard in there um, and some sunflowers and various other bits, just as a sort of a, a look-see. Um, but as you can see here on the left, mustard doing well, covering it up. You can sort of barely see some of the rape, but if you look down on it, you know, perfectly healthy rape plant in the bottom, good numbers, uh, very little pressure. And all this has had so far was uh, some glyphosate and a, um, some black grass control, but effectively very low inputs, try not to do a lot now uh, until the spring. We're also this year trialling uh, spring leaves of the oats and uh, bicrop and wheat and beans, just to, you know, variety is spice of life, they say, um, but diversity is also uh, key. I keep sort of banging on about that. Livestock integration is also really, really important to what we're trying to do here. Um, livestock, we feel, is probably the best way to get carbon into the soil and also have an impact on uh, cleaning fields up and, and um, just improving soil condition. As I said, you know, it's the fastest way to build carbon is through a long, you know, a grass lay, you've got continual cover, you've always got biology, you've then got livestock coming over, trampling, cycling those nutrients, depositing more, stimulating the ecosystem, and uh, it really helps clean up fields, which we've noticed off stuff where we've had black grass issues and brome, uh, putting grass in for four years, three, four years, makes a big difference, especially how you manage it. So the farm, quite keen on IPN. We don't, haven't put any insecticide on for five or so years. Also don't use any seed dressings. Uh, really want to, you know, why put a barrier between uh, what you can get naturally um, and, and just try and build on that. Every time you include any of that, you sort of take a step backwards in some way uh, and make it harder. So, you know, we've got a wide variety now of uh, beneficials and dung beetles are pretty key for us for an indicator. Um, not using any wormers, get a really increase that. The whole system is starting to really move and cycle. And you can notice that with a number of insects, uh, birds, you know, moths, everything flying around. We're also composting a cattle mark, which I'll go through in a minute um, for various reasons. But one is soil health and two, we are you know, trying to make a sterile product as much as possible for weed control. Um, just going back to the rotational lays. So within our, it's key to get, the, we've got 200 hectares of permanent pasture, but really we want to try and get those livestock rounds as much as our arable round, uh, land as possible. So we're trying to integrate the livestock in that. And some of that is through, you know, short term lays, which you sort of got on the left here, which is um, sort of a, a one or two year grass lay to rotate round. We've then got um, cutting lays where we've got salmon foil and other bits where we're making hail silage for over winter. We're keeping that constant ground cover and we've got uh, weed and disease cycle breaks. Here, we, you know, left hand side here, you can see some, this is one of our herbal lays at one point in the year. We've got a massive amount of biomass, a lot of carbon fixated lot of competition for any weeds um, and you know things like black grass and onions they actually don't like a lot of competition uh, and the cattle really thrive on it you know there's a hundred cattle in there you can sort of barely see them we're also getting real benefit for the environment this is a you know same mix on a different time of year I think it was taken in june we've got a massive amount of uh, flowers for pollinators and you're getting a natural regen on that grass 
um, and then the cattle still come in and eat it off. So we're doing this through mob grazing, maximum sort of carbon capture, a very high short periods, uh, high numbers on a small area if possible. So they move sort of every day or half a day. And then you have a very long recovery for those roots and all that biology to work and uh, the plant to recover. Rough rule of thumb of what we're doing, eat a third, trample a third and leave a third. Um, so you're, you've got that sort of, you've got deposits and removing it. You've got some trampling to get that organic matter back to soil service where the biology can then break it down. And then you're leaving some just as a cover um, and, and you get a quicker response um, in terms of recovery. This is, illustrate, this, is, this is what we sort of get left um, after the cattle have been through. So you see some of it's trampled down, some of it's left. You've got deposits and, um, you know, we use dung stores for dung beetles. Uh, it gives us a really good indication of uh, how the cattle are doing both in health, uh, but also, you know, what the environment's doing on that pasture. So come back to the composting cattle muck. Um, we tip and mix uh, wood chip into the cattle muck from the cattle sheds um, after winter, uh, just to correct and try and the um, carbon and nitrogen ratio to make it better for biology. Um, this is windrowed and then turned multiple times once it's heated up. Um, and this should sterilize weed seeds. And we see that, you know, these heaps, if you leave them, they don't grow anything on them um, other than the odd bit if you, you know, um, bit of windblown seed. But generally speaking, this is pretty sterile, um, not very scientific, I must admit, but um, it's, a, it's a good product. And you can see here the fresh and sort of compost analysis um, taken last year. We see, oops, sorry we're seeing a much sort of a greater increase um, from P and K availability and uh, magnesium, some of the others, also a bit of nitrogen. I must admit, this is, this is, this is lower than some of the others I've seen um, in terms of usually you have actually a greater um, nitrogen content. Uh, this is just showing the process through at various stages and we really want to end up with this nice dark chocolate brown light cover. It goes on quite a low rate um, and, and it's great sort of soil conditioner. So really, Anna Wiesru should be um, talking about weeds at some point uh, more than I have. Um, so I said, you know, we, back when they started the no-till, black grass was a real issue here um, and it had a dramatic decrease in black grass since we went no-till. Uh, it was varied the rotation with spring cropping and delayed drilling, which isn't always ideal, um, cold, slower emergence, but um, it has made a big difference here. Uh, so the wheat crop you see in the picture there at the bottom uh, is a crop of X days from last year. That All that's had is a um, spring herbicide and some glyphosate and drilling. Um, and you know that would have been a sea of black grass previously. And on the right is some winter wheat drilled into a uh, herbal lay. We've managed to retain some of the clover, which we're hoping to keep through the bottom. Uh, and all that's had is glyphosate so far uh, to kill the grass off. Um, one of the things we've also seen with the no-till, drilling into those covers is crucial, really, um, in that it really reduces weed emergence. Um, and we've seen a lot less, um, both broadleaf and grass leaves emerge, where we've had a physical barrier um, to stop them. We've had to, I think, no-till and this sort of approach really needs some real attention to detail and that, you know, you're on, you're managing on a field level um, much more than, you know, before it'd be, a, we'll, we'll spray that block um, probably. Now it's really looking at soil conditions, you know, what is germinating there? What's the cover like? How thick is it? What do we need to then approach uh, with a seed rate and, and when to drill? And, um, it, you know, there is a, a management time sort of, effect of that, but it does have a, a, a big benefit and does work. Um, we've seen, a, you know, a decreased reliance on pre and in general chemistry. We try not to use a pre because we want, the, you know, that crop to get away and get going. The most sort of root exudates and uh, sort of stimulation with the soil biology is in sort of first 50 days um, where we see, you know, that really ramp up. It then does tail off a bit. Uh, so we want to try and keep that. We do put some post them on, but most of it is then just, um, you know, a, a spring herbicide where we can and some culture controls. Um, 
just another example this this year wheat after rape you can see here we've got a good ground cover where we put some we had a bit of a catch crop plus rape, um, rape volunteers um, and this on the right here was probably that must be five six weeks after drilling uh, at the end of september and you know we had two and a half mil of rain uh, half an hour before i took that photo travels well very little there that did have a perium um sort of stack but uh yeah good soil condition crops all there sort of just a, another example where we're using high cover you've got a, a, a mulch this is actually a heritage wheat uh iron corn drilled into sort of quite high cover. I don't remember anyone remembers in one of the previous slides, there was some nice sort of facilia looking high covers. Um, this is drilled this autumn and that just shows now, this was that picture at the bottom there was taken uh, probably two weeks ago. Still not a lot of all that's had is a glyphosate, nothing else at all. So in terms of observations, as I said, I've, I've sort of, I'm fairly new here. I have sort of had a chat with John and Paul about previous and what they think has changed and where it's gone but certainly from observations from this year uh, and my sort of limited experience here I would say that we've probably had an increase in brome burdens and I think some of that is attention to detail so you know I'm not saying this is all all uh, great but some of it, I think it can be managed and we can see that uh, for instance the bottom picture on the left there um, there's, if you draw a line sort of half straight up the middle of that picture uh, on the right you'll see there's a, a much higher density of brome on the left there isn't some of that is purely rotational they had a rake trial on the left and a sewer on the right um, and I guess it's a mixture of uh, rotation and chemistry you know the brome level was so much less uh, in the rape and on the yield map from the combine we had one and over one and a half ton a week more on that section um, we're also seeing a change in spectrum in the broadleaf weeds um, previously you had more problems with cleavers and uh, some of your other sort of speed bells and common things that don't really see a problem with those now at all you see more problems with creeping thistle and south thistle and some of those probably because of the type of chemistry you're using probably doesn't target as much but also they're probably encouraged in some of the covers where they're you know not necessarily controlled germinate later and then and, and flower um rotation is really key um there is a few fields here where it's sort of slipped a bit and you end up with maybe five cereals in a row and it, you can see it they're, they're the fields that, where the problems are and interestingly uh ash trees seem to be more of a problem in a no-till approach because they're not taking in it chemistry doesn't take them out they do you know you end up with some small trees in the crop that we um, have to sort of culture control um during stubble and uh in crop if we see them so just Thirds going forward, our sort of our cover crop species choice is probably becoming more key in terms of making sure we've got ground cover, but also persistent ground cover. Quite a few, you get high biomass stuff like Phacelia, you get a lot there when you drill it uh, and go back two weeks later and it's disappeared to nothing. Um, so we're, we're starting to sort of be a bit more selective in terms of what covers we use for these mulches to try and get a really thick layer down um, above that soil uh, we we'll start also... to wrap up now please barney sorry that's all right <laughs> uh so yeah uh, we've got uh again catch crops is the same trying to get the most out of those and uh as i mentioned before we're much cleaner after grass lays and where livestock have been over much more weather resilient and uh we're including carbon sources in our herbicides where they're compatible just to try and reduce uh impact on um the biology we do have a growing concern over reliance on sort of our glyphosate. No-till is sort of pretty reliant on it in those covers and, and killing them off. Um, and looking at ways break crops work in the system, making them pay at the moment, which I know everyone else is in the same boat. Um, and increasing rotation, further livestock integration, as I sort of mentioned before. So some of the options we're sort of looking at, I know everyone else is probably in the same boat and you know, there is stuff coming, but it's uh, maybe not quite there yet. So thank you very much. So it's a whistle stop tour. That's great. Thank you, Barney.